over Britain, animals are being born, rearing the next generation, from hedgehogs to great apes like these gorillas, from cats to cart horses. We'll be travelling all over the UK, following the stories of the births wherever they happen. In zoos, on farms, in people's homes and out in the wild. We'll meet the people who are going to be responsible to make sure that they arrive safe and sound and hopefully on time. We'll be there to witness the trials and tribulations because as a vet I know that not everything goes to plan. <laughs> we'll share in the joy and the heartache of Britain's never-ending animal baby boom. Coming up, we take a trip to the West Country to see some newly born ponies and travel to a Birmingham junkyard where some baby kittens are rescued. But first, an animal that's in real trouble in the wild, the majestic rhino. Where they're found in Africa and Asia, their numbers are dropping dramatically because of poaching. But thankfully, there are people out there trying to conserve the species where they belong. But also, just as importantly, there's an active breeding programme here in captivity to try and keep the numbers up and give them a future. What a beautiful animal. The rhinoceros is extremely endangered. Charities and many zoos around the world are all pulling together to try and save them. The big problem is the myth that their horns have some sort of medicinal value. In Africa and Asia, these iconic prehistoric looking creatures are being persecuted by poachers because rhino horn can fetch huge amounts of money on the black market. It's so sad that they really are being decimated in the wild because of just this. The horn is ground down to make so-called medical products, but it has no medical benefit at all. Thankfully, Chester Zoo is doing its part by not only breeding them in captivity, but helping run programs out into the wild and funding conservation efforts to keep these animals around for generations to come. And thankfully, one of their female black rhino is pregnant. Emma is about to give birth. We call her Emma, but her proper name is Emma Elsa. Came from the Czech Republic. She's had one before, had a little girl before, but Gil just moved on to Denmark uh, last week. The gestation period for a rhino is 15 months, so it's hard to predict exactly when Emma's baby will arrive, but it's obvious that she's in some discomfort. Chaz has made up a bed of sand in one part of her pen and straw in the other, so she has a choice of where to give birth. We had two cameras in the pen and managed to capture the moment of the birth. The newly born rhino calf is soon standing and taking her first steps. Great news, it's all gone very well. Emma has done the job. We got the call from Chaz and the team here about five days ago when she was giving birth, and they've deemed her now relaxed enough and quiet enough for us to get a closer look. Shall we go and have a look? Oh, look at that. Oh, that's absolutely gorgeous. Oh, dear. All right, Mum. Boy or girl, Chaz? Girl. Is that what you wanted? It wouldn't make any difference to me what we had, <laughs> as long as it's fit and healthy. 
Yeah, oh, that's absolutely brilliant. So it all went well. You were happy with how yeah. Emma did. Yeah, but she's an extremely good mum the first time, and she's following suit now again. Very good. Birth went very easily, very quick. Uh, yeah, couldn't ask for better. What time? How long yeah. was she in labour? Minutes. You know, like, it wasn't long at all. That's amazing for the size of animal. You would think that, you know, it would be a, a drawn-out, painful affair, but she's a... Yeah, it is quick. But, but again, you look at a baby rhino, it's very sausage-shaped with small legs, so yeah. in theory, there's nothing to be caught. Yes, yeah, I suppose, yeah. Thankfully, she hasn't got the horns yet. <laughs> yeah, not yet. <laughs> that would make life very uncomfortable. And she's feeding it OK and taking care of it in that yeah. way? Yeah, she's fine. As I say, she's been a cracking mum, uh, so, yeah, doing, doing well. And what's going to happen with the, uh, with the little one? Is that going to stay with you long-term, or...? Approximately, probably about three years. Right. So we've got, you know, like, we usually... About two year old, we, uh, we separate from mum about that age, which is about the same as the wild, mm -hmm. is around that mark. So we'd split them up about then. And then the stud bookkeeper then decides which collection it goes to. Very good. Oh, look at that. And when will you start to see that horn forming? Because well, obviously there's none there at the moment. Yeah, it's, well, I suppose it'll be gra gradually growing now as she's, uh, as she's growing up now. So in a few weeks' time, you'll probably see a little bit more. And, uh, usually at that point, when it's a little bit like that, they start to look cross-eyed because they've not quite got the full length of the horn yet. Well, this has been a real treat to be able to get in so early after the birth. You don't get to see baby rhino like this very often. As Chaz now thinks that mum is relaxed enough for people to come in and out, there's another visitor for her. Here's our wee one. The zoo's vet. Gabby has an appointment. She can't physically go in and give the baby a checkup, so she uses a state of the art thermal imaging camera. It's just a really quick little check to make sure everything's okay. We just popped over with the thermal camera, which uh, lets us look at the baby's temperature, making sure that it's not too hot and not too cold, making sure that the environment's the right sort of temperature for her. Um, it'll be particularly important when she starts going outside, because as we're coming into winter, it could get very cold. And obviously, if baby starts to get too cold, we want to make sure the keepers know to be able to get her back in again so she can warm up. The baby's plenty warm enough. You can see where the umbilical cord's going to drop off because it's cold. It's because she's so tiny, she can lose her body heat really quickly and she could chill quite quickly on the paddock and so it's important the keepers can know to, that she's getting cold and bring her back inside again. The keepers certainly couldn't go and take a temperature on the little baby, so using the, the thermal camera, a remote method is much, much safer for everybody and non-stressful for mum and baby. That's a, the first uh, few-day-old baby rhino I've ever seen, so she looks brilliant. She's uh, very, very sweet and nice and active and bright and alert, so that's everything we want. These black rhino here at Chester Zoo are only one of two main species found in South Africa and East Africa. There is actually a larger cousin, the white rhino. They're bigger, they like to graze, and they can also be found in the South Lakes with a chap called David Gill, who's got a very special relationship with his rhino. Unlike the solitary black rhino, white rhinos graze in herds. They're also under severe threat from poaching. They've proved difficult to breed in captivity, but David has had some success over the past few years. Indiana is uh, the third baby to be born here, and we're so proud of him because he's part of the increasing captive population of white rhinos. Him and his mother, Tomby here, are very special members of that, uh, that breeding programme. And uh, Tomby here, she's actually had two babies now. To think that this horn and this horn is what they're being made extinct for. It's such a stupid thing. It's not even connected to the skull, you know. It actually wobbles about on the front of the nose. It's just a piece of fingernail, basically, keratin fingernail, that grows just to protect the vulnerability of the mouth and the eyes. So the, the horn's been developed over millions of years as a protective thing, not as a, a weapon or anything like that. Successful breeding stories like this and others such as Emma at Chester offer a small glimmer of hope
for the future of these magnificent beasts. Now we're heading south to meet one of the oldest native species in Britain. In the southwest of England, Exmoor National Park contains an amazing variety of wild animals and is home to Britain's only truly wild horse, the Exmoor Pony. Unlike other horses and ponies, the Exmoor Pony is truly native. It's been here since the last ice age, 10,000 years ago, and basically has remained unchanged ever since. Other breeds, such as the Dartmoor and Welsh Pony, have been crossbred by man over centuries, but on remote Exmoor, the last remains of the original wild pony continue to breed. By the 1920s, there were only a handful left, and some of the old farming families on the moor got together and formed a society to protect them. Yes, we've got a head colour, I'm sorry. Good girl. Abby Westcott's family was amongst them, and they're still involved today. Our family have had Exmoors for over 200 years and created the Exmoor Pony Society and kept them split into different herds and groups to keep the bloodlines because they were all wild, they weren't touched. Although most of the Exmoor ponies roam free, Abby's family keep their herd on a farm at the edge of the moor. Come on. Ours live in ground, but they're not tame. They tend to be closer to people and see us each day and know that we're not going to hurt them, but they keep to themselves because they're very much wild. Sadly, during the Second World War, when meat rationing was enforced, many ponies were poached for food. So by the 1940s, there were just four stallions and around 50 females left. It, it did come very close to losing them, but luckily, we sort of got to that and thought, oh, we have to do something about this and brought it all back and got them going again. But it went through a couple hairy patches. Today, there are over 2,000 ponies roaming on the moor and every spring, the next generation appears. Around 220 foals are born each year. The ponies are incredibly shy and secretive, so they take themselves deep into the gorse bushes to give birth. And once their foals are on their feet, they rejoin the herd. When you see an Exmoor foal, it's different. They're that much more timid and sort of think, hang on, I'm, I'm not sure I'm meant to be coming up to you. This isn't normal. They're very much wild instincts and they stick with them. They tend to stay back in the shadows and watch you study you first and then they'll decide if you're all right to come up and see. <laughs> They're wild animals. They don't need to be mollycoddled. You see Exmoors out on the moor perfectly fine with their natural coats. Although they do live wild up on the moor, once a year they gather all of the ponies, mix them up and then release them back out onto the moor to keep the genetic populations healthy. It's at this stage that some of the surplus ponies are sold and they can be tamed to be used for riding, just like Abby's pony, Woo. It's my heritage and if we lost the wild Exmoors, well, it'd hardly be worth calling it Exmoor, would it? <laughs> because they're a part of our world. They're just fantastic. Everyone should have the chance to see them. This looks like one of the last places on Earth that you'd find an animal baby. There's broken glass, jagged metal, cars being crushed. But believe it or not, in Birmingham, in a place just like this, the guys working there made a little fluffy discovery. In this industrial-sized car recycling plant in Birmingham, up to 200 cars are crushed for scrap every day. Old cars are stripped of any useful parts that can be reused, the fuel and oil is then drained off, and the cars are then crushed into small cubes. It's also the home of an elusive stray cat who hadn't been seen for a few days. The scrapyard workers were worried about her, but 
she had a secret. We had a Porsche 944 in. We've had it in the yard for about two weeks. It came to nobody wanted parts off it, so we were going to scrap it. The old Porsche was lifted up onto a forklift truck for her final journey to the crushing machine. I'm going to go get a spare wheel. Suddenly, one of the scrapyard workers, Stan, checked the boot to see if there was a spare tyre he could salvage. I forgot all about the spare wheel, so I said, drop it down, I've got to get the spare wheel, eh? Tried, tried the boot lid, and it, we ain't got the key to it, so it's been quite a big lad. I've got a car to get in there, rather than me crawling in there. And he's got in there, and all of a sudden he said, did you hear something? Like could this be where the missing stray had been hiding? I could hear squealing, and I said to Stan, I said to Stan and Wes, I said, can you hear that? And they were like, yeah, we can hear that. Unbelievably, in the car they were about to crush, they found four newly born kittens. Mum, the elusive stray, had been busy rearing the kittens in the boot. Now, the guys, obviously not being experts, popped the kittens into a box and went online for some more information. They were as cute as anything. Like, I mean, we are all pretty big blokes, rough blokes, and that's what people couldn't believe. Rough, <laughs> rough, uh, rough old blokes saving little kittens and that looks unreal. Unusual, like, I've never come across anything like this before. I, I couldn't believe it when I just opened that. I don't know what I was expecting, to be honest with you. And I opened, I was just like, whoa, four kittens just sitting there. With the car only seconds away from the crusher, these kittens had a very lucky escape. That car was going straight to the crusher. The forklift literally had the car up, ready to take out these gates right here and around to our scrapyard. And nobody would have known no different then. I wouldn't have been any wiser. They'd been crushed into a block. Fortunately, but uh, look was on the side that day. <laughs> With the mother cat still nowhere to be seen, the lads had to look after the kittens themselves. We took them out, put them in the box, I took them to the office. I put milk in there originally, and then when I'm, I'm no cat expert, so when I looked on, there was loads of people saying, that's brilliant what you've done, but you've got to, uh, you, you shouldn't be giving them normal milk. People were saying, best to put them back, see if the mother cat comes back, feeds them. So we put them back. Two days after, we come back, and in the boots, of the car where they, where they was. They weren't there, there was no sign of them. So there's a fox at them or something or what. With the mother cat and kittens missing in such a hostile environment, the hunt was on. We finally looked all around the place and we found that she took them to a van, which is amazing really, because the van, there's just one little door ajar, the back doors are wedged against another, and there's a little slot in a wooden cutout. And she had to get up there with each one, drop them in there, it's just... She's an amazing cat, really, the mum, it's unreal. But, uh, we found them again. With cars being shunted around, stripped down and crushed on an hourly basis, these scrapyard kittens seem to be perfectly safe and secure. Keeping the cats, they've been here now about a week. We're feeding the mother. The cats are a bit too young for us to be feeding. So we're going to feed the mother, make sure the mother feeds the cats and make sure everything's all right. We're thinking this is where she went through. There's a little hole in the wood there. So we're not going to disturb them too much. We're just going to give them some food. See what happens. Now, the mother's not here at the moment, which is probably safer for us all, really. As you can see, the four kittens are down the end there. The mother is in and out on a regular recurrence, so they are safe. We know they're healthy. And as you can see, they're cuddled up as a nice little bunch there. Yeah. And I'm actually allergic to cats, so it's hard for me every time I'm near them. I actually start not sneezing. My eyes are watering all, but... Um, Cat rearing is harder than a lot of people think. You do have to be there constantly for them, you know? And you've always got to check on them. Now, we know the mother's there with them, but she's a feral cat and she can be in danger as well, so we do keep our eye on them. The guys have decided to let the kittens stay at the yard to follow in their mother's footsteps, helping keep the site free of mice and rats. It makes you want to come to work and actually get on and see how the kittens actually are, you know? It's, it's an exciting thing and to be part of it's even better, you know, that kind of way. So um, we're delighted with the outcome of this, to be fair. So, even though our kittens have downgraded their ride from a Porsche to an old van, they seem safe, happy and healthy, with their scrapyard guardians looking over them. Back at Chester, it's two weeks since my last visit. The rhino mum and baby are still out of sight from the public in their private enclosure, and I've come back to see how they're both doing. Just, you can see that she's still really, really laid back. And look, our babies come right up as well. 
It's so much stronger now. It's, it seems to be moving much freer. Still not outside. The weather's not been with us totally. Do you want all of that, do you, Poppet? And this is... <laughs> a little bit of a sneeze. Scare yourself there, little one. This is a great example of the difference between the black and white rhino. In the wild, they are browsers, so they will be sampling branches and leaves like this, and they'll chew even the woodiest material up. So you can see how she's sucking that in there. And this pointy lip for taking delicate branches, as opposed to having a big, wide, grazing mouth. I can't believe that how close we can get to such an amazingly large and powerful animal. And yet, in the wild, it really is, again, in such a vulnerable position. It's hard to reconcile the power and the armaments that this animal has, and yet it has got such an undecided future. Thankfully, these two are very safe. They're in a great position. And hopefully, we'll go to some small way to secure the future of this really amazing species. I can't believe I'm feeding a black rhino. I'm feeding a black rhino. <laughs>